Hello, everyone. Welcome to the British Library South Asia seminar series, which is part of our research and digitization project called Two Centuries of Indian Print. We are very happy to have Dr. Arun Kumar amongst us today, who's going to speak on workers' libraries in colonial Bombay. Arun is a historian of modern India with an interest in social, economic, education, and labor history. He is an assistant professor of British imperial and colonial history at Nottingham University. His work explores different facets of working class life histories, including their aspirations, education, nighttime histories, and childhood. He's currently working on his first book project on working class caste education in modern India. Arun has very kindly entrusted me with the responsibility of being a respondent for his talk today, and I will try my best um, to, to justice to his paper. Uh, those of you who do not know me, I am the curator uh, for the Two Centuries of Indian Print Project, and my name is Priyanka Basu. But without much further ado, I will now hand it over to Arun to start his work. Uh, we'll follow uh, our usual format where Arun is going to present for about 40, 45 minutes, after which we'll have a short discussion for about 15, 20 minutes, following which I'll open it up for audience questions. But if in the meanwhile, while Arun is presenting or we are having our discussion, you want to put in your questions, please use the chat box or the Q&A box to do so. And I'll take them in order in our question answer session. So Arun, it's over to you. And we are eagerly waiting to hear you speak on workers' libraries in colonial Bombay. Thank you so much, Priyanka, for inviting me and uh, for giving me this opportunity to present at the British Library. Um, I would say that that's probably the mecca for South Asian scholars because uh, their work, their research work would not be finished uh, if they don't uh, look at the material which is uh, the rich material, which is at the British Library, especially in the Asia and Africa section. And uh, I've used a lot of material from the British Library uh, in my work, in my doctoral work and postdoctoral work. And uh, some of it, I'll be showing it to you in this talk as well. But thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, as I was doing the PR for my own talk, uh, I was saying that I was very much, uh, um, what you can say, surprised uh, by the stark contra uh, contrast, sharp contrast and uh, difference between the two kind of institutions that are connecting us together. So on the one end, uh, workers' libraries uh, back in the 20th century, in the early parts of the 20th century, and the British Library um, and these two libraries are probably uh, are like two extreme uh, in, in the literary world, I can say. And as you'll see that, uh, like the British Library, uh, they have been kind of uh, generating uh, knowledge and uh, a generation of uh, workers who are trained uh, to read books, who know how to uh, how to discuss a book and how to learn from a book. So I'm going to share my screen um, so that I can start uh, presenting uh, my work. Um, just to say one more thing that I'm very much closely involved with the free library movement uh, in our rural areas of North India, where a team of uh, young enthusiasts have come up to set up rural libraries. And these are community libraries um, catering to the needs of villagers, uh, giving them books, uh, which uh, are usually available in, in bigger urban centers like Bombay, Bangalore, Delhi, which rarely reach to rural areas. So we're trying to kind of provide uh, these world-class books, quality books, to rural uh, people, to rural folks, um, through through donation and through other ways, and these libraries are working uh, even during this period uh, through uh, home loan, basically, 
the books are given uh, for for a month and they could be kept at uh, at, at uh, with the reader for for a month or so and uh, and then they can return many of the times they don't come back to return the books but precisely uh, that that's the point in the sense uh, that uh, we're trying to kind of spread the quality books to 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 people who have been kind of denied access maybe because of their uh, their own uh, situation or uh, because of the structural uh, inequalities that we are part of. So uh, these libraries that I'm going to talk about, uh, they're also kind of doing a similar kind of work. So in a way, they're an inspiration for many of us who actually do work uh, with community libraries and uh, advocate for the community libraries. So I hope you are able to see my screen. Priyanka, just to confirm, are you able to see my screen now? Yes, it's perfect. Great, thank you so much. So uh, I'll start directly uh, from my first slide, which is that what is this lecture about? So on the one hand, uh, I'll be mapping workers libraries in late colonial Bombay. Uh, I'll be studying mainly the libraries which were situated in the working class neighborhoods. So neighborhood is going to be a primary uh, spatial category through which we are going to analyze the role of workers libraries in late colonial Bombay. For many of you, uh, this theme might seem a little bit strange because uh, in the usual labor history and social history and education history of India, we haven't talked much about libraries uh, and more so of workers libraries. Perhaps I didn't uh, know anything about them uh, until I started researching on workers libraries. So, uh, so I hope uh, many of you will find this talk interesting from that perspective that it has something new to offer. We're going to know that who established these libraries and where why did workers attend these libraries? And why should we bother about these libraries or workers literacy slash reading culture? Before uh, entering into the world of workers libraries, let's know a little bit about Bombay's working class. As many of you know that Bombay uh, is a metropolis in the western part of India. It is a historic uh, urban center, uh, a center of textile and a center of industrial activity. So Bombay was a city, plus it was also an industrial center. It had textiles, it had railways, docks, and other institutions like, uh, like the Times of India printing workshop, uh, or the postal uh, um, uh, stations of the Western India in the late 90th and early 20th century. This is the period where I'll be discussing uh, the workers' libraries most. The historian of Bombay, one of the prominent historians of Bombay, Rajnaran Chandavarkar, who spent his lifetime working on the history of Bombay as a city and the history of working Bombay's working class, he suggests that industrial strategies and the colonial state shaped the migrant, uh, the migrant working population as much as workers' own cultural views and community ethos. So the, the nature of the Bombay working class was shaped by the actions of the colonial state, uh, the decisions taken by uh, male employers or the rich industrialist, and uh, the cultural views and community ties of the workers, whether on the lines of caste, religion, or other um, uh, other lines like uh, ethnicity or region. As you know, that Bombay uh, Bombay uh, was a was a city of textile mills. The first textile mills appeared in the 1854, and by 1885, there were about 70 mills operating in the Bombay city. 
but uh, the working class was shaped by other uh, factors as well. The Bombay uh, as a land scarce city where the land was little because of the coastal frontier um, as a middle class and professional service class hub and as an anti-caste political center that also saved Bombay's working class. And we're going to touch upon these themes uh, very briefly. Uh, at least the, these themes are shaping the history of Bombay's reading culture, uh, Bombay's workers' literary culture. Now, the question is that, were Bombay's workers illiterate? In colonial understanding, by that I mean colonial officials, yes, they were. They were not only illiterate, but they were also ignorant. Now, these terms you would find in many uh, colonial records, in colonial sociology, in colonial ethnographic works, where uh, there is a kind of assumption that, that the people in India, especially the poorer people or the working people, are illiterate and ignorant, and hence they are also uh, they are also poor. So it's a kind of cyclical nature of poverty, illiteracy, and ignorance that you find in many colonial records. That remains a dominant understanding even after post-colonial uh, times. In academic understanding, workers are seen as an illiterate. There is an uh, assumption that the workers were illiterate, the vast majority of the workers, uh, those who were working on the labor history of Bombay uh, or other parts of India, they assumed that the workers were illiterate, but they were also political beings. Uh, so were interested in the strikes, uh, organizing themselves against, uh, against the encroachment of uh, employers uh, and, uh, and showing uh, class and caste solidarity. In workers' understanding, we do not know what workers thought, whether they were illiterate or ignorant. Uh, we don't have much sources, much sources from workers' side. But anyway, the dominant knowledge, including the academic knowledge, has been dominated by certain assumptions and lack of new questions. By that, I mean that there is an emphasis that we should do labor history from the standpoint of work, that the work should be our primary criteria that should define the working lives. I find that a little bit um, limiting, uh, if not problematic, because we cannot know about the working lives if we just focus on the work or from the standpoint of the work. So we have to ask new questions. That is that what workers are doing outside work hours uh, if they are if they are doing anything, are they just sleeping? Um, are they imagining any life outside work? And if if they are imagining a life outside work, which is beyond strikes, struggle at the workshop, or or fights with employers, or um, basic struggle of life, what are they doing? And my work, in a way, tries to kind of capture that ethos of working lives beyond uh, the work regime. Of course, the work regime is very central in informing that uh, beyond the work life regime. So, so it's not that the work uh, and the workshop and the work environment is not part of my analytic, but I'm saying that we need to move beyond the work analytic to understand the working lives. And we will see this through uh, the case of uh, libraries and night schools. My focus will be on one institution called the Social Service League, which was established in 1911 in Bombay, who started traveling libraries from 1912. So this is very much um, in the early decades of the 20th century. By now, the Bombay's working population is huge. It's uh, more, more than 200,000 workers uh, uh, in terms of factory workers, but then there are other types of uh, workers who are working at railways, uh, working in various small fac uh, factories, which are not counted under the factory laws uh, in small 
household industries uh, as domestic servants, as postal workers, as transport workers, and as clerks. So, so the work, uh, so the, so the population of the Bombay uh, has increased, uh, and and by by the twentieth century, there is certain character which could be given to Bombay. Uh, as as a working class city uh, because of the domination of the workers and the workers were living in uh, in various parts of uh, bombay uh, and uh, i wouldn't go uh, into detail as to neighborhoods uh, which i look after uh, uh, which i look uh, uh, in my work uh, straight jumping onto the social service league which was a body of um, middle class uh, bombay uh, people um, headed by nm joshi uh, who was very much active into the politics and um, um, the league uh, is is is, uh, is its institution that starts the very idea of social service uh, in india one can say that it's uh, it's uh, it's organized on the lines of classes rather than on the caste even though caste would become an important factor in organizing its work. Um, so, so the Social Service League uh, is catering to the poor working classes of Bombay. Their aim is to look after people uh, in terms of uh, their health, uh, their reading habits, their, uh, their education, um, by providing them different kinds of services, uh, whether it is uh, the help through petition, whether it is through dispensaries or through uh, schools and libraries. The SSL, I'll call it SSL, which is Social Service League, uh, they started 70 traveling libraries with 5,000 books in 1912 and 13. These libraries covered about uh, 104 hosting centers, which were located in the poor working class neighborhoods, especially in South Bombay. These 70 traveling libraries were basically library boxes where each library had about 50 books and they were taken care by one child resident librarian. These boxes would move from one center to the other. So at one point, one center will have at least one library box uh, or two or three library box at the same time, depending on the reading capabilities. Now, they were not just catering to factory workers. Of course, the factory workers were a major part of their uh, reader audience, but they were also kind of catering to, um, to clerical uh, workers, to postal workers, to, uh, to hawkers to domestic servants and railway workers. Now, the interesting thing is that these libraries were looked after by a child resident librarian who was also typically a night school teacher, which I'll talk about these night schools uh, uh, in a while. Um, but what, what's interesting to note is that, that these libraries were traveling so they were not static they were static in one sense because uh, the library box would be kept at one hosting center for a month but these books would move which means that the each center is actually looking at different books over a period of time so in a one year period one center may actually be exposed to five six library boxes yeah so they're exposed to different different books and 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 then there is also a kind of broader point that people are reading similar literature the interesting part is which which fascinates me is the way the ssl started mobilizing its resources to capture the working classes or the or the laboring population of bombay because their focus was on these backward what they call backward lower caste uh, people the league aimed at three types of audiences. Uh, in their words, the middle and low caste females, the depressed classes, the Dalits, and the backward classes. The interesting feature of this, these uh, libraries were that they were really very really low caste libraries. 
so they didn't have a proper building. They were just, they could be actually housed in one of the educated or literate uh, person's house. Uh, so night, uh, and they would be kind of usually read during the night. So night and neighborhood was the entry point for these libraries. And they catered to different linguistic social groups and occupational categories, as we will see. Now, I'll be talking a lot about uh, some statistics, but I think these statistics are useful to understand the extent of the reading culture among Bombay's working population. So please don't get bored uh, when I'm talking about the statistics, because these are perhaps one of the rare statistics that we get about the literary culture of workers in India, in modern India. So as per the leaks record, between July 1912 to July 1913, at least 2,765 low and middle caste readers borrowed uh, about 10,000 books. And then they give further the linguistic, uh, the linguistic description of the uh, types of books which have been issued. Now these terms low and middle caste uh, are interesting uh, and we will look what does that mean uh, in a while. The same, uh, in the same period, about 455 women uh, from, the poor, uh, from the poorer neighborhoods borrowed about 1400 books. So, uh, so what we're seeing is that, that there are females uh, are also involved as readers, which was the stated aim of, of the SSL libraries and about 663 Dalits borrowed about 1900 text in this period, which is just one year. This is the kind of archive that I'm talking about. Uh, this is the social service quarterly reports, uh, which were published by the Social Service League. And towards the end, you would see that uh, way below, if you could see that there is a section called quarterly report of the Social Service League Bombay. My archive comes from those uh, social service uh, league reports, which are quarterly or yearly sometime. And then I'm also using the Times of India archive. Now these social service quarterly reports are at the BL. Uh, so I'm very thankful to the British Library for preserving these uh, rare, rare material. What we see is that workers are not just readers of the SSL libraries, they're also managers of the SSL libraries. By 1905, and this is the time uh, when the World War I has already started, the demand for books was so much that there were 161 library hosting centers. So uh, 60, about six, 60 more hosting centers were opened out of these 161 centers, 27 centers were handled by female librarians, 20 by Dalits, three by poor Parsis, and the rest by the backward classes. Uh, the phrases in quotations are the ones that are being used by the SSL uh, reports. So I have kept them as it is, uh, they were being reported. Of course, there is a lot of uh, interpretation and uh, deconstruction that needs to be done with these phrases. Um, and perhaps they're um, telling more and hiding uh, a little bit uh, about the social profile of, uh, of, of people who are actually attending and using these circulating libraries. So we, see, we have seen that um, the Marathi and the Gujarati population was the target. But in the early years, Urdu and Hindustani speaking working population was left out in the beginning. Um, as you know that Bombay attracted a lot of uh, weavers and peasants from North India, especially from the United Provinces, which is today's Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, uh, who came to work not only just as weavers, uh, artisan, uh, as a weaver artisan, but also as factory workers and within factory as weavers or outside the factory as handloom weavers and also at the railway workshops. So there was substantial presence of working population from North India 
uh, in neighborhoods or areas like Madanpura. So the Hindustani speaking Pardesi or Purabias as they were called from the north were left out initially from this scheme. The worker librarian Mandule raised this point in February 1913 library meeting suggesting that few libraries of Hindu Hindi books were needed in the chals occupied by Purabia people. So what he's saying that, that we need to expand the SSL libraries to this uh, segment of working population which had been left out initially. So what uh, we are also kind of uh, seeing is that that there is a dialogue which is which which is going on within the SSL as to the target audience. So we see there is a broadening of that reader audience from the reports. I already mentioned that there were quite significant female readers uh, of the SSL libraries. In terms of female readership, it increased from 445 in 1932, 1913 to uh, 1832 in 1914 and 15. To promote reading culture among working women, one library, one library each was established or kept at the sieving class of the Mahila Mandal in Parel, which was a working class neighborhood and at the Noraji Vaidya lying in hospitals, perhaps for the nurses as well. And in this period, the large majority of the female leaders were Gujarati speaking background. That intrigued me as to why there were so many books which were being uh, issued by females from Gujarati uh, speaking or Gujarati uh, affiliation background. And I looked at the records, it appears that Gujarat was one of the prominent um, region in terms of educational statistics, uh, educational records. It had the highest literary, lit liter literacy rates uh, in Western India as a state or as a province, uh, which kind of uh, gives certain idea, perhaps uh, new um, research questions as to the number of lit literate uh, people uh, uh, on the gender lines and also the role of mothers, uh, Gujarati mothers um, in, in educating their children. I will leave this here and, and move. Uh, we can come back in the uh, question hour session. Um, of course, lots of books were lost and stolen um, I'm sure the BL has a very interesting system of recovering the books which are lost or stolen, but these libraries actually struggled uh, to recover those books because here we are talking about, about an extremely mobile and precarious population or laboring group who are actually um, at the mercy of employers in terms of their occupation, in terms of their job security, and also uh, in terms of the larger events that are affecting their lives, whether it is plague, whether it is World War I, or um, the strikes which are forcing workers to leave Bombay for various reasons, yeah, for health, for political reasons, or for military reasons. Yeah. Again, the librarian Mandule reported about difficulties in recovering books from the mill hands on account of their abruptly leaving Bombay. That's the report saying. In the first year, about 105 books were lost. In a July 1913 librarians meeting, the same meeting, it was decided to not lend books to people living very far from the lending center so that a control over, um, over the books and the readers can be maintained um, and, and, and the person or the librarian or the resident librarian, the worker resident librarian can actually collect the books when required if they're within the chawl or uh, at the, in the neighboring chawl. Later, uh, by the 1918 onwards, we see a shift in SSL's policy that they started 
to having standing libraries, which is that physical library, uh, not just traveling libraries. Of course, they would continue to uh, they would continue with traveling libraries, but they would also establish standing libraries, which will be housed at one particular center. So they established various welfare centers. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, one or two uh, centers, but um, just to kind of reiterate certain points about the league that it was run with the financial support of Bombay's rich people, usually the aristocratic class, but also the mill employers and other service class like lawyers, judges, academics. And uh, it was helped uh, and sustained by young volunteers, uh, social reformers uh, of Bombay University and elsewhere. Uh, what we see is that in this period, uh, what Prasant Kidambi calls the broadening of the notion of social service. And there is from, from social reform, so we are moving within the history of modern India, we are moving from social reform that were con concentrated uh, on the idea of reforming their inner communities or the actions or the practices of the inner communities to a reform of, of classes or a broadly one social group. So outside the community reform. And Social Service League is one of the prominent institution that makes that departure in terms of broadening the very meaning of social service and national service. So these middle-class social reformers, young students and young volunteers, cadets of the Social Service League are not only just doing a social service, but also a national service. And, uh, and, and they're interacting uh, with different caste and with different class groups, um, which is the most interesting part of this social service in this period. The Social Service League would establish welfare centers in the working class neighborhoods, particularly Madanpura, Parel, and Tardev. Of course, there were also other centers as well but I'm going to focus on these three centers um, in the 1920s, uh, just to show that how certain areas of working class became the center of uh, literary activities, which we usually miss if we are just focusing on the factory records or on the colonial estate or, or the records of the colonial estate. The 1920s was also the time of extreme unsettlement for working classes. It was also a time of political exuberance uh, among Bombay's factory and workshop workers. Strikes were becoming common across the industry for just from department. There were like there was a shift in, in the way strikes were being organized. So there were industry-wide strikes. And there was also the emergence of left, left politics, the communist politics, uh, uh, the establishment of the Girni Kamgar Union in 1926, and also various other political bodies like the Workers and Peasants um, Party, which were very much critical in supplying and translating a number of Marxist uh, texts uh, into Marathi and other languages. This has been uh, very recently discussed by Junaid Saik in his book, uh, Outcast Bombay, that looks at the translation of Marxist text into Marathi and also um, the reading uh, uh, kind of scope uh, within Dalit uh, and other workers of Bombay. Now, focusing on the Madanpura, so the Madanpura, as I said, was uh, sent, uh, was a neighborhood or an area where Muslim weavers lived predominantly, and the SSL established uh, a library there. The Madanpura uh, Center established an Urdu library in 1918 with 87 books, two Urdu weeklies, and one English monthly. Now, you would see that uh, here they're not supplying so many Marathi or Gujarati uh, uh, books, but rather uh, they're trying to cater to migrants from North India who are mostly handloom weavers and weavers in the factory. And, uh, and for the wives and daughters uh, of, of these weavers, they're also kind of running uh, 
four circulating libraries in the Madanpura region. What is interesting is to note uh, is to notice the expansion of the uh, Weaver Library in this period. So from 1918 to 1920, we see that the library has expanded um, in a significant manner. In 1920, there were 700 books, 10 Urdu dailies, three Urdu bi-weeklies, bi two weeklies, two English dailies, six weeklies, three monthlies, and then few Gujarati and Marathi journal, including the Samas Sevak, which was published by the Social Service League. Now, one would wonder why there is so why there is so much demand for these journals and newspapers. I think um, people here were looking for uh, news. I think as a as a as a kind of important source of information. Uh, as I said, this is the time very unsettling time. This is the time of the war, uh, and you see that libraries are reporting that workers are interested in knowing about what's happening at the war front but they are also interested in following the news um, about the textile industry or the industry-wide uh, protests that are happening. Then um, the SSL also established a library for mill workers, railway artisans, hawkers, and servants at Chinspokli. Now, this library continues to survive and I'm using uh, in fact, I'm, I'm uh, taking this picture from the Social Service League's website um, uh, of their Chinchpokli library, uh, which is continuing work even now, and I think has celebrated its probably 100 years in 2006, uh, 2017, I think. Um, this library, uh, again, uh, was very hit among workers and among the laboring population. In the last quarters of 1921, there were about there were about 4,000 readers who were registered, and they borrowed uh, books about um, 1,000 or more than 1,000 times. Uh, in 1926, this number increases. You can see uh, that the number of readers was increased to uh, about 1,400, and they borrowed. Um, uh, about 22, uh, 2200 items. At present, there's a collection of 21,000 books. This information, I just took it from, from that library uh, page. Um, and at Tardiv, they established a Dalit uh, library or a library exclusively for Dalits, which shows that, uh, that SSL is very attentive to the caste uh, caste ethos, uh, Shinde, who's also kind of participating in, in anti-caste politics, um, uh, is, is very much kind of um, uh, part of the depressed, uh, depressed class mission, um, which uh, started in, uh, in early 1900s. Uh, here you see that again, uh, same kind of enthusiasm for library among uh, Dalit uh, population, mainly the laboring people uh, who were working at Great India Peninsula Railway Company. In the first qu quarter of 1919, about 1400 readers visited the reading room and 98 members issued books. So the library was making permanent members who could issue books. Um, and in the last quarters, the number uh, were 2500 and 225 respectively. Seeing the success at the Tardev Library, the SSL also established other exclusive uh, Dalit libraries in various neighborhoods and chawls uh, where Dalits resided. So in Devi, Baikula, uh, Walpkhari, the library in Baikula, for example, it was located in Ripon House at Balasis Road and it housed 300 books and was open between 8 a.m. 11 a.m. Uh, perhaps for the kids, for the children, and between 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. for adults who are working population. So you could see that these workers, uh, these working libraries are actually running in chawls in one of the rooms, which was either being, um, uh, the rent was even being uh, supported by one of the members 
uh, of the SSL or uh, or what being was being borne by uh, by the residents of that shawl uh, collectively. Uh, I don't have much information about how um, how the rent was worked out. Um, now, how can an illiterate working population read so much? That's the question. And I think if we think that, uh, or if we take the logic of colonial understanding or academic dominant academic understanding that the workers were predominantly illiterate, then either these reports are speaking lie or we are doing something uh, which is not up to date. And I think my sense is that uh, our questions have been not uh, so um, sophisticated uh, to actually understand the dynamic of working lives. I think it, if workers kind of worked for 11 hours on an average in the 20th century, uh, of course they were working more than this, but I'm saying as an average, how, can, how could they learn reading and appreciate book learning? It's a very commonsensical question. Perhaps they would not be interested in learning books. Uh, after doing that much of labor, they would need sleep or they would rest. But actually, uh, you would be surprised and I was surprised to know that, that the workers used night uh, time, the time of the night to imagine a life beyond the manual labor. They attended night schools, which were opened by the Social Service League, but also by workers uh, themselves and, and by other uh, social reform bodies. And they learned to read and write. This is a picture of a uh, night school from Bombay. And I cover the history of night schools um, in, in, in my work. Uh, we can uh, pick on this in the discussion. So what I'm suggesting is that to understand this dynamic and uh, very interesting history of the working lives, we have to actually explore and ask nuanced methodological questions, but also analytical uh, questions, which is to explore the workers' night, their sleeping patterns, and the history of the night schools. The question is that, can we still assume that the working classes in Bombay were illiterate? I wouldn't uh, assume that. Uh, what we are actually seeing that there is actually a prolif uh, proliferation of a subaltern literary culture in the 20th century in Bombay. And that could be particular to Bombay. It may not be replicated, but I think I've looked at the figures in Kanpur, which were actually on the lower sides. Again, it was a textile center, but you see again, a similar kind of dynamic in the working class neighborhoods in Kanpur as well which I discussed in the paper, uh, but I haven't uh, brought it out in the, in the presentation for the sake of time. So the figures that I've discussed or presented were, have, were perhaps inflated uh, by those who are reporting uh, for the SSL uh, head office to show the success of their libraries and to show the success of the league for the rich public who were their funders. But the problem, uh, or, but the question is that, could they inflate those kind of figures to this extent. Uh, and for that, I try to kind of look information elsewhere. And um, one finds that uh, beyond, uh, the, the beyond uh, colonial records, you, that, you find that uh, Morris D. Morris reports that in 1940, the average literacy rates among Bombay workers was about 29.7%, which increases to 42.1% in 1955, he writes. Uh, 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 in his work, he, uh, Morris de Morris is an economist who worked on the Bombay. He was one of the earliest person who actually explored Bombay's working class history in the 1960s. And he writes, by comparison with five years ago, I have been struck by the number of workers I've seen in the mill area sitting on the pavement teaching others to read. Now, this is an interesting quote. Morris de Morris himself uh, hadn't talked about the educational life of workers but he gives interesting insights, mm, uh, which uh, I thought will be worth picking up. So uh, I tried to look what was this reading culture or reading aloud culture, uh, which we also, I think one of our 
libraries in the rural areas currently that we are looking after is also kind of inculcating the reading aloud culture. Uh, the SSL was doing the same in the 1920s. So the illiterate would participate in large numbers in the public book readings, what they call the public book readings. For example, in 1913, at least 2,500 workers attended uh, 131 public reading of books at 20 centers. There are other statistics about this, which shows that an increasing uh, uh, interest uh, for, for literary um, texts. But what, what, what was it that the SSL wanted workers to read? And uh, we all would be asking, what is it that workers are reading? We don't get much information actually uh, in terms of the collection uh, of, of the books that the SSL, but we get some understanding. Of course, the aim of the SSL was to create an educated civil sober working class in Bombay uh, uh, in the times of uh, plague, in the times of increasing militancy and violence. Uh, and this is also the time when the communal violence would start hitting Bombay uh, from the late 19th century. And of course, the coming of the fear of a Bolshevik revolution in India. Yeah. So an early report of the libraries mentioned that each traveling library actually contained books on biographies of uh, important personalities, history books, religious uh, books, books on mythology, travel, sanitation, and and hygiene and several essays and of course the newspapers and magazines the interesting thing is that one could guess a sense of what kind of books actually would have been circulating but uh, of course we don't get the name of the books but we can guess from the fact that these books were being donated by middle class people or uh, literary literary uh, the traditional literary caste people uh, those who were working in, in courts or in the municipal offices who had the ability to buy books or, or keep books, they were donating books for the SSL. So it is possible that the workers are actually reading uh, literature, which is just not quote unquote, one could say that the cheap literature, but they are also actually reading high class literature, which actually was being read by the middle classes. Uh, and this comes via the donation. So out of 3000 books in 1913, 2000 were donations from people. The rest were, were, brought, were bought from booksellers. The library at the League's head office in Parel was ex exclusively consisted of books on social and labor problems, numbering in all about 1400, about 1400 books, uh, 1800 uh, pamphlets and 80 periodicals. Anyway, I think I should be um, coming towards the end of my uh, presentation. The question is that how were workers using this um, literary uh, literary um, literacy skills or uh, literary skills? Um, of course, one uh, possible answer um, that I provide in my work is that they are of course holding books and enjoying the privilege of reading, which in this period, in the early uh, parts of the 20th century and the late 19th century is still very much embedded in the caste hierarchies where knowledge is uh, very much mm, into the hands of certain uh, literary caste um, and uh, it's a it's a heritage of pre-colonial times but a heritage that is kind of uh, given a new life with the colonial state's ambivalent position on whether to actually educate the lower caste or the untouchable caste or not uh, or whether to actually not educate them. So, so in that kind of environment, we are actually seeing a, a democratization of reading culture and the privilege of the reading uh, is being demanded by workers uh, who of course uh, are predominantly from either from lower caste background, or quote unquote, untouchable background. And they have been denied uh, this reading culture either because of poverty or because of access to schooling or libraries or to caste. And I look some other figures like how uh, in the normal uh, or like the usual libraries of the city, uh, whether there was an entry for 
lower cost or untouchable. So for example, I found the evidence of a library, uh, which is like uh, not in the Bombay city, but uh, way near like about 50 kilometers from Bombay in a region where actually um, uh, Dalits were not allowed uh, to enter into the usual city or town libraries, public libraries uh, of the town. So they're also using this reading ability uh, to read religious literature in early morning. So I look at the records, family records of certain Dalit uh, families, uh, which is being provided by sociologists uh, in this period who are interested in reading about Dalit lives. And they say that, uh, they explain that how actually uh, Dalit workers and others are reading religious liter literature on, uh, in the morning before the work and on holidays. And of course, uh, they're using the literary skills to read and write letters and to become poets and writers in the paper. I give an example of, uh, of a working class poet who becomes very popular uh, and is being co-opted by the, by the peasant and workers party, uh, workers and peasant party, uh, and also by the communist of Bombay. And he narrated or he wrote poems on on strikes, uh, 1928 strike, 1920, uh, 1929 strike, and was used uh, by, by uh, communist parties to mobilize workers. Uh, again, literate, wo literate workers were co-opted by the mill management uh, for clerical positions uh, or supervisory positions at higher salaries. So there is a kind of aspiration to move beyond the more kind of, uh, uh, yeah, the more um, extremely harsh manual labor positions by the communist and socialist parties to actually work for the party as a propagandist or as, uh, as, as workers who would write material for the party. And by the social reform bodies like, um, by, like the Social Service League, uh, uh, YMCA and other um, uh, um, bodies like uh, Prathna Samaj, and of course, the low uh, level literary jobs requiring reading and writing skills such as postmen, typewriters, typists in this period. I would like to end my talk um, as to kind of relevance of this kind of uh, work. And I think uh, one uh, way of kind of uh, analyzing this material is to to actually kind of enter into new terrain of uh, labor history writing, which is to explore the subaltern literary cultures or the, or, the, or the working class intellectual histories. And perhaps there is a need to do that kind of history and to explore that history of uh, uh, aspiration and desire of reading and writing, uh, because um, we don't know much um, about that and that, uh, uh, and th that lack of knowledge is actually also kind of uh, giving us certain assumptions on which our understanding, whether it is policies or the government uh, activities are actually based on uh, that the workers would not be interested in any kind of uh, uh, literary efforts if we make. So those kind of assumptions are kind of being, uh, being kind of circulated uh, uh, for example, that, oh, uh, why should uh, workers uh, be interested in this kind of uh, high works? Perhaps uh, we need to engage more uh, with these kind of histories to make sense of, uh, to make sense of this, this world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arun, for that fascinating presentation. And I uh, have had the good fortune of reading your paper. So, um, my responses would be uh, based around that. But um, I would like to start by, you know, thinking of your work in terms of recent scholarship on uh, labor histories focusing on Bombay. And one that you have already mentioned, Prashant uh, Kidambi's work, but also Aditya Sarkar's work on the mills of Bombay. Uh, in thinking about Kidambi's work, especially where he speaks about associational activity in late colonial Bombay, uh, through caste associations, clerical unions, libraries, nationalist groups, commercial bodies, cricket clubs, etc. Uh, the idea here is that associations were methods of non-antagonistic relationships with the urban poor. 
So where do you see your work in this proposition? Uh, where the libraries and aims for literacy also being developed uh, to create docile bodies as opposed to strikes, sit-in protests, communal clashes, and uh, rebellion against capitalists? And also, how do you see the librarian as a political middle actor in this? So that would be my first um, set of questions to you. Um, I think, yeah, you have raised a very important question, uh, which is, what is, uh, what is the aim of uh, the, these libraries or what is the actually eventual implication or after effects of, of, of these uh, projects? Of course, as you say that uh, they're trying to kind of blunt that militant nature of the working class in this period. And of course, to create um, an aware citizenry uh, in terms of one which could follow at least the orders when there is a like, like a pandemic crisis, yeah? So remember, this is the time, I mean, this is also the time when uh, Bombay has vis witnessed series of plagues, yeah, cholera. So, so, the, so they have identified that working population is something which is unmanageable. And this is not a problem which is peculiar to Bombay. It is a problem which is peculiar to every industrializing city in this world, um, which is, seeing uh, militancy, uh, also disorganized nature because of the land is scarce or house is scarce, uh, uh, societies um, uh, leading people to kind of live in slum areas or in crowded, overcrowded chawls. So you see actually uh, that, of course, that effort is that, but the question is that, um, that is, is that the history of, uh, is that the only history of these working class libraries? And I think my tentative answer is that no, actually, uh, you would never know that how workers are going to use the literary skills or the reading and writing capabilities that they have mastered either through the night schools or through the working class libraries in their lives, they could use it for their own better, like yeah, better futures, or to educate their children, or to even to be part of the communist movement as 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 someone who's reading aloud things or reading aloud, interpreting things, uh, reading newspapers for workers. So you would never know actually the end outcome unless we have those kind of sociological studies. And we do find that actually some of these. Um, yeah, some of these readers actually become uh, SSLs, night school teachers, they become uh, full-time librarians, uh, and they become, uh, yeah, they aspire, they, 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 they try to kind of apply for jobs differently, but many actually don't do anything. They just, yeah, they just become literate and probably at some point they also become illiterate because they don't engage with, with, with the reading or sustain the reading uh, culture. So you, you would never know um, uh, uh, in that sense, like what is the actual outcome in, 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 large, uh, in large time period. And uh, so, uh, yes, it is interesting to kind of find, like found out what the, what the people who were organizing these libraries wanted, but also to understand why workers are actually participating in that program, yeah. Thank you, Arun. Uh, my second question is uh, with regard to women. You do speak about them um, and you speak about women as readers and borrowing books from the traveling libraries. Uh, could you shed some more light on what was the content and nature of books women were reading? And are there any records where the nuances of women's domestic labor, their work in factories and other sectors and the cultural labor of reading books are highlighted. Are there ways of you know, uh, digging this up from the literature or the archives that you're looking at? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I don't have much information on this Priyanka. Um, uh, the, the SSL reports don't provide as to what uh, the nature of books that each library contain. So I, I, I really don't know, um, yeah about this as to what actually the, I mean, other than like the reading profile, which is that language profile, linguistic profile of women that we come to know, 
I myself was interested kind of in knowing exactly what, what is it that they want them to read. So um, yeah, it doesn't give much. Yeah, yeah. Maybe someone from the audience would be able to help out. I was also thinking of your work in terms of, um, you know, Craig uh, Koslovsky's book on Evening's Empire. Uh, history of night. Uh, I mean, he follows a time period which is much earlier than the one that you are looking at. He looks at early modern Europe, but he talks about uh, street lighting as changing the you know entire rhythm of upper crust life. But mm -hmm. it doesn't affect rural life as such because there um, it follows. It, it's it's different from the uh, way it affects uh, life in urban spaces. So do you see a resonance of this in the work that you are doing, like uh, the way um, workers are being affected uh, in Bombay, but how, how are they responding, uh, you know, beyond, beyond the city in rural areas? Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question, actually. Uh, so Bombay starts having street lighting at the end of the, I think the 19th century it becomes, the mills also start having electric, bulbs and uh, one thing that they did was that uh, that it extended the work hours so the night shift starts uh, opening up in many mills and which workers protest um, but others found find it as a source of employment and uh, others find it as a source of exploit uh, exploitation but it definitely I think changes uh, the very way urban patterns were kind of emerging uh, people could use the street light for various purposes. And I wondered to what extent it was uh, there in the neighborhood, working class neighborhood. So I'm not sure um, in that sense, uh, but regarding the question about the rural and the uh, urban, I think uh, definitely uh, mm, what, what is interesting is that more than electric lights, they're using the gas light, yeah? So the gas uh, uh, cylinder bulbs that are being used are prominent in, in urban areas, but also like in areas like Nagpur where the Tata mill, uh, the Tata mills, the, um, the Empress mill, yeah, it's called, it was, it was organized by or run by Tata. So there you, again, you find like, uh, I mean, the picture that I shared for the British library, uh, it has a, I think gas, um, bulb in, uh, I think in front. Uh, but I think what's interesting is that, and there's not much work actually, which is the history of the kerosene and how it changes uh, the rural areas. And I was watching one uh, documentary, which is towards the 1940s and, uh, and it's on that Burma oil company and how uh, people are actually um, using, starts using, um, the tin uh, holders uh, that the company is providing uh, for uh, for not just I mean using the oil for purpose, but also kind of using it uh, to kind of create structures, house structures. So so the leftover tin is being used differently for uh, for using it as a kind of light, also uh, keeping making a lamp. Huh? So. So there is a kind of definitely a history of kerosene. So one, I wouldn't say that the rural part was living in the darkness. So um, uh, yeah, we need the history of like matchboxes and kerosenes to actually know more about the rural. Um, my next question, and which was like, I mean, I was uh, thinking constantly about it when you were presenting is the nexus between print and performance. Um, since it is linked directly to what you talk about workers emerging as poets on the one hand and the community rituals of singing and reading together in the challs. And um, the example that comes to mind immediately is that it's, it's a later example of Anabhau Sate, uh, mm -hmm. who was a folk singer, Dalit folk singer, writer, poet. And uh, he was also employing folk forms like Powada, Lavni, Tamasha, and was roped into the uh, Marxist cultural movement, uh, Indian People's Theater Association. And uh, the People's War, War newspaper reports uh, on his performances. And you bring in the, uh, uh, an earlier example of uh, Gangaram and Pandudevag, 
and uh, the poem, um, I don't know if it is a performed poem or if it is a performed piece, uh, but a poem which is uh, talking about rebellion against the capitalist order, but employing allusions towards uh, for, um, to Shivaji, to you know the in the Indian epics like Ramayana and Mahabharat, and also to the larger concept of Kali Yuk. Hmm? So, uh, do you have like examples? I know the IPTA history uh, focuses a lot on exemplary figures, but is there a way to you know um, kind of dig out the involvement of these worker poets? Uh, in in cultural movements, Marxist Marxist cultural movements, which are beyond the IPT, are there examples of that which you found in the archives? I think uh, that would be very fascinating. If um, yeah, I try to kind of follow some of these uh, uh, poets and writers, and uh, one of the I just I think I was looking at uh, I mentioned also like there are lots of uh, novelists which are being kind of read by uh, workers. And uh, these are, of course, workers, uh, sorry, novelists who are writing in Marathi. So, which a language which I don't know myself. So, um, uh, except like to read it in a very brittle form. So, um, in terms of like, I think uh, ritual, so what I'm saying is that, yes, there is a larger kind of body of uh, workers emerging as poets, as uh, novelists. And uh, definitely um, more kind of like work in the like vernacular libraries would yield insights uh, into this. Uh, and uh, uh, re regarding the ritual, I think that poem that I shared, it was actually performed uh, during the strikes and to also kind of mobilize people. So, um, and I think it was picking up from the popular folk like uh, culture of, of uh, performances, uh, um, both in terms of, uh, I think, public um, oriented, but also kind of very, uh, um, uh, very kind of politically oriented kind of uh, performances. And uh, remember, this is also the time when uh, the cinema is coming uh, in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, so that again becomes a way, so um, not the cinema, but basically more like lan lantern slides, if you know those things. So those were like uh, uh, slides, visuals, uh, which were shown to workers uh, in these welfare centers. And they were mainly centered around various religious uh, themes like Mahabharata and Ramayan and others. And of course, the regional histories uh, like of Sivaji and others. So they would show, uh, and of course, there were themes on hygiene and all that. So there is a kind of an element of uh, uh, performance uh, that is definitely there in the social service league's uh, attempt because uh, it, it has to be like that because even the very idea of reading aloud uh, uh, is a kind of performance, yeah. It has to be performed for a number of people. So, so uh, the performance becomes important because they're dealing with a very um, fluid, uh, literary, uh, uh, fluid category of population, which is, which is kind of on the bottom lines of whether they can read or not. Yeah. So they might be able to read one or two words, but they might. So, so it becomes performance be becomes very important. Yeah. Thank you so much, Arun. And my last couple of questions uh, is related to your to the work that you are doing in terms of rural development library. So I have like three related questions. One is um, more immediate, like how has the pandemic uh, impacted it? Uh, the second is about what roles can we play in propagating it like actively? And the third is about uh, how do you situate your own historical research vis-a-vis -vis the work that you are doing with the free library movement, the work that you are involved in? Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for asking that question. I think that gives me some time to talk about my own work, <laughs> practical work, the field work. Um, so this rural development library um, was something that I thought of long back, but it never, like, got re it never got realized until 2020 when I visited my home. And uh, there's already like 
three libraries which have come up in uh, UP. They are called community library and two of them are very close to my village, like about 10 kilometers away. So I got in touch with those people and then we thought, okay, we can have one library in my area as well. So the, the idea of the library is to kind of, as I said, to provide quality books, yeah, things that you cannot access uh, from village because usually uh, like this whole idea of um, uh, bookshops is, is very urban in that sense. Usually in uh, rural areas, you have actually shops which sell uh, textbooks. Uh, they can't be called bookshops, yeah? They're, they're, they're basically selling uh, books for students. And so there is no kind of that independent bookshop culture. So we thought, okay, we'll, we'll try to kind of bring books from Delhi, Bombay. And I think that's where the role uh, of people can come. You can, uh, we, I mean, people can send books and they can help people uh, in terms of like getting uh, yeah, interesting things, whether it is the online technology methods or, uh, or any other kind of uh, learning technology uh, tools. So a lot of people have come up like uh, in terms of giving books to us and we're using an Amazon um, wish list to actually create um, uh, a book uh, list, what we want uh, and also what people from village actually want. So, so it's a mix of like what we want them to read and what they want to read. Yeah, so it has to be kind of, uh, because the there is a kind of information gap whether we accept or not between people who are in the rural areas and people who are in the urban areas, yeah, who have been exposed to higher forms of education. And in terms of the pandemic, I think um, um, this Kalanpur library, the, the rural development library has been uh, kind of officially kind of shut uh, uh, for physical access, but we are still kind of lending books. Uh, to people. So about like 20 books are actually issued to people. And uh, we hope to come back uh, into action once the lockdown is kind of lifted or things improve. Yeah. Thank you so much, Arun. I'm not going to take up more time and I'm no expert in labor history. <laughs> Those were very general questions that I that came to my mind when I was reading your paper. And uh, hearing you speak, but we have questions coming in already and we have five of them. So I'm going to take them in order. The first one is from Shashwat Panda. Thank you, Dr. Kumar for the richly insightful talk. My question is in connection with the Bolshevik revolution and its impact on the working class. Did the colonial authorities keep an eye on the libraries suspecting secret circulation of pro-Soviet literature? Were such kind of literary works popular among the workers? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question, Saswat. Um, so this um, theme has been dealt also by uh, one of uh, historians who, who I actually cited in the presentation, Junaid Sekh, whose book Outcast Bombay actually touches upon this theme very uh, centrally as to the kind of uh, Bolshevik uh, literature that is actually infiltrating into India and through various uh, young uh, Marxists uh, who are actually visiting Germany uh, and Russia and other parts of Western world and are actually bringing. So there's a lot of censorship which is involved uh, in this period, but it's still there is, uh, as, as um, uh, Junaid shows that there is a lot of like circulation of Bolshevik revolution, not just circulation of the original text, but also the translation and transliteration of those of those texts, and uh, to the point that actually you have um, a sedition case against Indian um, political uh, actors, uh, which this colonial state called them as in kind of uh, revolutionaries who wanted to actually, um, yeah, who wanted to basically dethrone the British crown from India. So they were trial. Uh, it was it's actually made a conspiracy case in 1930. And uh, the, the trial records, which I use extensively in my work, shows the kind of uh, Marxist liter literature which has been, uh, been kind of circulating, but also which has been seized by the colonial state. 
and it shows the fear that uh, the colonial state has about the infiltration of uh, revolutionary literature uh, within Bombay, but also in Kanpur and Bengal uh, and uh, in rural areas as well. Uh, so you see um, a number of socialist parties coming up uh, in various parts of India after 1930s uh, or during the 1930s. So uh, yes, it is, uh, it is a big thing actually. The next question is from uh, Sruti Kopikar. Insightful presentation, thank you. My question is this, do you draw a link between this library culture among working class and Dalit writing in Bombay that came decades later? If so, how? Um, no, actually, but Junaid, Junaid does it. Uh, he has a chapter on post-colonial uh, uh, Dalit literature. Uh, so I think if you are interested in that, uh, you might be actually be interested in reading his uh, book, uh, which is titled as Outcast Bombay. Thank you, Arun. The next question is from Lalita D'Souza. Was there any censorship of book donations to these workers' libraries? Mm, that's a very interesting question. I have no answer to that. I'm sure there must be some censorship uh, some consideration, but uh, maybe not in the initial years when they are actually trying to create a like a collection of books. Uh, definitely towards the like maybe 19, late 1920s, like 25, 26, 27, 1927, 28, which becomes like extremely critical years for Bombay in terms of uh, militancy, workers' militancy. So there might be an attempt to actually censure those kind of. Uh, um, works which might, um, yeah, which might actually uh, invoke uh, revolutionary feelings among workers, but also maybe um, there might be some censorship involved in terms of uh, literature, uh, which is overtly probably quote unquote sexual in nature for them. So yeah, but the reports, they don't talk about this. The next question is from Baba Sahib Kambale. Who were the readers of the library run by Dalits? Did non-Dalits use, um, yeah, did they go into the Dalit library as well? Uh, how was the seating arrangements for the Dalit readers in the general libraries? Was their untouchability followed in these libraries? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so my understanding, it doesn't give much sense actually in terms of like untouchability question. Uh, or the seating uh, arrangement. But I think my sense is that that the SSL had to come up exclusive, like, like quote unquote, uh, libraries for depressed classes. Uh, but I think it's kind of uh, needs some attention from our side and deconstruction, which is why is it that the SSL is needing these exclusive libraries? And perhaps one of the reasons was that that the Dalits were not so much welcome into normal neighborhood libraries uh, of, of the SSL. So there are two possible kind of uh, answers to that, uh, which is that one, that there is a, an increased uh, number of Dalit population in certain neighborhoods, which uh, required a separate library, or the other was that the Dalits were not welcome into other libraries uh, of the SSL. Both possibilities are there. The SSL uh, reports, they're silent, and so is the Times of India, which I use extensively. Um, in terms of readers uh, uh, within the Dalits, I think uh, mostly they are uh, the one who are working for uh, the GIPR and the one, I mean, the, the visible ones that the reports talk, the GIPR, the Great India Peninsula Railway Company workshop workers the municipal workers and uh, the factory uh, workers themselves. So those are like the prominent uh, people from uh, uh, quote unquote, uh, what, they call, what they call the depressed classes that they are kind of entertaining uh, in their libraries. Uh, the next question is from Deepak Barkhade. Uh, is working class readership part of the mainstream forms of communication? What is the relationship between a logic of readership and communication? How much privilege do you count this sort of history 
in with regard to the dalits um i didn't understand the communication part if uh, um if he could write as to what he meant by communication and uh, until that maybe okay then uh, moving on to the next question um this is somebody who hasn't provided her or his name uh, regarding the rural development library i was wondering if there are big regional discrepancies in access to libraries in different regions for example does someone in rural west bengal or kerala have more access to libraries than up or bihar if not are there similar projects in these regions uh, i think there are regional discrepancies very much i think kerala has a long tradition of uh, uh neighborhood libraries especially i think the communist party uh, reading culture so definitely they have a much longer tradition of uh, uh libraries north india did have a library movement back in the 1930s and 40s which was called the gram sudhar library movement uh, uh but that somehow kind of uh, was stopped or was uh, yeah was not worth kind of giving attention in the 1960s so it dropped uh, so and and post that i think uh, there was hardly any attempt to actually uh, start new libraries in rural areas um, so uh, even the schools they don't have proper libraries so forget about normal libraries the schools also don't have like even own the, their own libraries uh, and the government school they might have one room but that that will be always locked so the school that i went which was a government school um um for my uh, senior secondary it had a library but it was always like locked yeah so you would never go there and while um, the other schools that i went for my high school and uh, previous classes they they didn't have even a library so which i think is even the case now so So yes, I think there is a reasonable discrepancy. The next question is from Amanda Lanzillo. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I was struck by your emphasis on the importance of newspapers in these libraries, particularly because they do seem so evocative of a space where literacy and orality intersected. Could you talk a bit more about which newspapers were subscribed by the libraries? were these also newspapers that serialized stories did they reflect middle class reading preferences in the same ways as some of the books were their newspapers uh, aimed explicitly at workers in bombay mm -hmm. yeah i think um, um they were looking for newspapers which were in regional languages so for madanpura library they were definitely looking for urdu uh, newspapers and urdu magazines and uh, of course the ssl uh, they had their own what they call like a journal newspaper the samaj sudhar yeah so they they subscribed that to every each and every library uh, that they were kind of having as a kind of permanent standing library so uh, so the regional newspapers uh, uh, which i actually compile a list actually uh, which i i mean i I'm, i'm happy to share that list with you amanda uh of all these newspapers but beyond uh, you know these middle class and um, uh newspapers which the ssl wanted the uh, wanted the worker to read there were also a lot of uh, um kind of worker initiated kind of uh, newspapers which had come so for example i think the, um the one on the, i think the payame mazdoor i think there was one uh, uh, if i'm uh, i think remember correctly and then kranti of course by by the communist uh, which again become very popular among workers and a uh, few more which i write in my paper um, uh, i don't remember their name exactly uh, so the, the the there is quite an emphasis on newspaper uh, in that sense yeah thanks sarun we have two more questions um one is again um the person hasn't provided uh, any name in terms of archival sources um do you also find or explore library catalogs if yes what sense do they give us about the workers uh, about what the workers are reading um i try to actually look for library catalogs you get library catalogs of uh, normal libraries yeah 
like the public libraries, uh, the big public libraries, but you don't get any catalog for these workers libraries. And the only information about these libraries is either in the reports of the social service league or any commentary on the social service league by any other reporter. Yeah. So, so you, and there again, you don't get any information. So the Times of India is constantly reporting on the SSL acti activities. And I think they're feeding on all, uh, feeding on the reports uh, that these, uh, that the, the SSL is producing. So I'm sure, uh, I'm not sure if they're actually doing any kind of independent in investigation, uh, which leaves us uh, with, with very, kind of very little material and, um, yeah, I think I should, uh, I try to go to Bombay and explore this, uh, the archive, the SSL archive, which was kind of un unsuccessful. Uh, and I wonder if uh, I could actually go to this uh, Chinch Pokli library and see if they have any material left. Um, that would be very interesting. Yeah, but I, um, yeah, I understand that. Thanks, Arun. And your last question is from Madhav Nair. In terms of archival sources, did you also find or exp oh this this is the last question you've already answered it so okay. I don't think I don't think uh, we have any more questions unless you wanted to uh, no. say uh, something else. One that Deep Deepak Deepak ji asked about the working class and communication. Um, um, uh, I would like to know more about uh, what he meant by communication uh, because I couldn't get a sense, but I will be happy to answer that over email as well. So my email is there on like if you, yeah, I think on, on the university's website, so it should be there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arun, for that fascinating presentation and all the work that you are doing in terms of your own research and also the free library movement, which uh, I'm very interested in. And please let us know um, how from the British Library we could, you know, connect and help uh, in, in, in getting the, this, uh, you know, in, in propagating and uh, spreading uh, more information about this and contributing in terms of books um, and, and to reaching out to people. Thank you all the audience members who joined us tonight. Uh, I know a lot of you have joined from India, so it's really late for you. Uh, so thank you for staying up. Um, our next talk is by Rahi Addo from SOAS. Uh, it is on 28th of June same time, 5.30 p.m. And she will be speaking on the gender journey of uh, the Rup Kotha. So we will be moving to West Bengal uh, from Bombay. Uh, thank you again. Uh, stay safe. Good night and take care of yourselves. Thank you.